Uh, welcome to the last session for the day. Uh, the session is called Illuminating the New What's Next. It's a student panel. It's uh, students from six institutions across um, Australia that have tertiary glass in their courses. Of course, we all know that our glass and our art education is under threat, and some of these courses are holding on by a very fragile string. But we've got light still in all the states, um, and here are some of our new bright lights. <laughs> As is usual with student projects and student presentations, while you've been listening to the wonderful talks from the educators from China, which is overwhelming seeing the progress there, we have been putting this thing together with sticky tape in the cinema next door. Um, so we're going to go from west to east. So we're going to start, first of all, with Western Australia, and we're going to start with Prina Shah. Prina, can you come up? Uh, Prina actually has a degree in sociology, uh, which she got in England at Loughborough University. And then she came out to Western Australia, where she worked for Philip, Pete Reynolds, Pete Reynolds um, and as an assistant, and moved from that into her bachelor's degree. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep, cool. Um, firstly, I'd just like to thank Anna for organizing all of us and introducing all of the students to each other and really making us feel at home, so thank you. And thank you, Ozglass, for the opportunity to present here. So I will begin. So I'm Prina Shah, and I'm from Edith Cowan University in Western Australia in Perth. Um, it's a brilliant university with all sorts of glass facilities, which I'll talk about in my presentation. So as Anna said, um, I studied a BA in contemporary art, and as part of that, I've worked on and off yeah, with glass throughout my degree, which has been brilliant. Um, so I'll talk about one project that I worked on near the end of my degree, uh, more of a conceptual art project, focusing on my upbringing as a Jain. So does anyone know what Jainism is? Have you heard of Jainism? Okay, so I'll, I'll start with what Jainism is, and warning, uh, one of the slides contains nudity. You'll enjoy it. <laughs> okay, so Jains believe that the only way to save one own soul is to protect every other soul. And so the most central teaching in Jain, uh, at the heart of the Jain ethics, is that of ahimsa, which is nonviolence, basically. Um, this goes beyond the act of physical nonviolence, and it's a way of. Um, living, breathing, every act that you do has to contain every form of ahimsa. Uh, so, and Jains are supposed to apply this to the every deed, thought, and speech. What does that mean, and how is it practiced, which is an interesting one, especially in Western society. So, nonviolence, um, okay, ahimsa, nonviolence. So, the symbol that best represents this concept of nonviolence or ahimsa is a brush called the Morpichi, which is the peacock feathered brush up there in the top right. Uh, and that's made of naturally shed peacock feathers, uh, which are given by members of the community to an offering to uh, sadhus and sadhvis. Uh, these are ascetics. These guys. Um, use it to sweep the ground in front of them as they walk, so not to harm any creature that's in their path. Just move this down. Sorry, bear with me. Um, and so not to harm any creature. Um, the Morpichi is one of their minimal belongings. 
uh, in their initiation, the sadhus and sadhvis um, renounce all of their worldly positions. So they live a life with pretty much nothing. The majority of them have the brush to walk, uh, to sweep the ground, the ground before they walk. Um, some have a white robe. Uh, they don't have a home. They walk the streets and um, they rely on the gift of food from society, so they have a bowl that they carry as well, very similar to Buddhist monks. Um, and there's one form of the sadhus who renounce clothing as well. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting in the research that I was doing. Okay. So these are the guys. The peacock feathers are a reminder of the, their ascetic desires, vanity, and all that they've renounced. The concept of ahimsa is as fragile as glass, and it's a long forgotten value in society in which most Jains now live. Um, this inspired me and I got researching, so I did lots and lots of research. Uh, lots of lots of research design onto peacock feathers, the handles, uh, the actual religion itself I researched into. Um, I ordered lots and lots of peacock feathers. I've still got a heap left at home, so if anyone's interested, have a chat to me afterwards. Don't know what to do with them. Um, so yeah, really interesting research and design I went into. Then the making phase of the project. So I designed uh, what I wanted to do, and at ECU we've got a hot glass furnace as well as kiln, so we're pretty lucky there. Um, David Hay lectures on glass uh, for visual art and design students, so we've got a couple of degrees that um, allow you to study art. Pete Reynolds is a resident glass artist, and Pete and David supervised me on this project. And Denise Pepper, who is here, is a technician, and she's mentored me pretty much throughout my degree. So I've been very lucky to have really talented people uh, to learn from. So this is the making process. Cold working then uh, was really interesting in learning how to grind, UV, gluing, all sorts. So the piece itself, uh, we made, I had the assistance of Pete and David as well, we made in separate um, sections and then put it all together using UV glue, and then it was exhibited, and this is the final piece. And that is me. <laughs> Thank you. What I didn't say was that we'll save the questions until right at the end of the session. Okay. So our next student is Naomi Hunter. She's a doctoral candidate here at the University of South Australia. She actually was seduced by glass when she was in Western Australia and she was doing a degree in art management and she did glass as an elective and from there on begins her story. Thanks, Anna. So I'm doing a juggling act, so bear with me. Um, I'm presenting today fragments of writing, um, memories, as well as uh, segments from the developing research. My exploration of understanding the body concentrates on one aspect of the body or a fragment in time. This allows space for the connections and interrelatedness of the parts to become gradually evident. Whilst this research is contained for the purposes of this particular research project, it's a subject that is so vast and intricate that I imagine I'll continue to revisit and reassess it throughout my creative career. One of my earliest memories of being distinctly aware of my body was as a young child. It was late afternoon, I'm about four years old, and I'm playing in our typical quarter acre backyard in suburban Western Australia. I'm running about barefoot in the yard, round and round the outside of a recently built shed. And as I ran, I stood on something hidden in the sand and felt a sharp pain in the bottom of my right foot. Collapsing on the ground, I clutched my foot, examining my soul, wondering what had happened. The skin was broken in a long line diagonally across the arch of my foot. And as I looked closer, it seemed wet. 
I could see white and pink things inside the wound. In front of my eyes, this angry breach in the skin began to bleed profusely, and I started to scream. <clears throat> Where does the body begin and end? How do we know our own bodies, and how do we understand our bodies when its elements are familiar, although often invisible to the self? This very broad question is where I began contemplating how I'm not consciously aware of exactly how each organ looks or functions. I know they're there as I'm alive and functioning apparently within the normal parameters. I recently saw a TV documentary and it was called Guts, the strange and mysterious world of the human stomach. This showed a voyeuristic journey through presenter Michael Mosley's intestinal tract. Mosley uses a small camera, small enough to swallow, and is able to tra transmit footage as it travels through the body. Sitting perched on a medical trolley, he was eating a steak. Mosley is watching his body's internal reactions on a monitor. What interested me in this footage, besides the fascinating imagery of a digestive tract at work, was that Mosley experienced this visually in the same manner as myself. The body I live with and examine is my own. I cannot separate my body from thoughts and the act of perception. Just as I cannot separate my experience of having a body and this research project, I'm relying on my senses to gain an understanding of the world in which I live. I cannot use my dominant sense of vision to access many areas of my body as they're hidden beneath layers of skin. Often I'm not consciously aware of or able to control all my body's actions or functions. I can imagine what the interior looks like, and to gain an understanding of the interior of my body, I turned to other bodies. One way was through the pathology and anatomy department of UniSA, as well as photographs, films and x-rays that are taken through medical imaging technology, and of course cultural and creative works relating to being a body. To an extent, it's through medical and scientific technologies the skin has become transparent. My project uses creative production to investigate the differing boundaries between being a body, understanding a body, and being embodied. Glass making within a studio environment, as most of us know, requires a team effort, so I need to be able to articulate to my assistants the process and decide outcomes. As I worked in the studio, I developed the habit... Try again. There we go. Um, the de um, developed the habit of documentation. Um, and a lot of this was actually through filming, drawing and writing, allowing me to clarify the ideas and my process of production. This method of documentation was not intended to be presented, but to allow me to work through ideas and encapsulate my thoughts relating to the material. However, when I was reviewing the recordings, um, of the making process, I found myself abstracting segments of film which became works in themselves. And they're the two works that you've seen so far. And normally they're in quite a small room and they take up an entire wall so that your body as the viewer actually interacts with the film as well. So you can actually um, see yourself within that or your shadow. Um, it's through the creation of abstract body-like fragments I endeavour to explore the inaccessible interior and create a way to experience or understand it in a manner outside the imagery that it's produced for scientific purposes. Glass is a paradoxical substance that can be in many states. Its transparent materiality allows a simultaneous experience of the interior and exterior of the object, which is a way to express the experience of a body being at once accessible and inaccessible. And that's me. Thank you, Naomi. Okay, so, whoops, I'm short. Um, next we have uh, Darcy Smith. Darcy Smith is um, Victorian, she's from Monash University. She has a certificate in dance, and she's finished her second year of her visual art degree. And she's the Monash, um, I suppose, recipient of their scholarship to Pilchuck for next year.
Uh, yeah, I am short, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, so yeah, I'm Darcy Smith. Um, I reside in Warrigal, Victoria, so that's about an hour and a half from Melbourne, and I'm entering my third year of studying my Bachelor of Fine Art at Monash. So in my first year of university, I ended the semester with focusing on the movement of the body to observe a map that wasn't entirely visible, um, therefore relying on light to be able to see painted gloss white lines um, covering an entire white room. So it was an uninspected uh, an unexpected and indirect visual experience of subtle intervention in an overlooked area of the studios, which was the washroom of paintbrushes. Um, so most mentors that I have had at, uni had at uni and crossed paths with have described my practice as subtle, fragile, and delicate. And funnily enough, glass has played pretty well into that. So I've always been intrigued by transparency, light and movement, and words couldn't actually describe my excitement when I heard Monash were reopening the glass workshop, which all of you heard about it closing, etc. cetera, um, for electives so I could finally work with glass and gain knowledge about it. So I happily revoked the credit I gained from previous studies um, to enrol in the unit at the start of last year. So I have only been doing glass for a year. So um, five weeks into the first semester, I had a car accident that was close to being fatal. <laughs> so I was taken to the Alfred Hospital in critical condition, and I can't remember a thing of it. All I happen to remember is waking up at the Alfred Hospital with doctors and nurses surrounding me, asking what my name was, what my date of birth was, if I knew why I was there, what had happened, um, all swells falling in and out of consciousness. Um, so I was in hospital for a week and on bed rest for another two minimum until I felt I had the ability to be able to do anything, get up, walk around, as um, I was suffering effects from a concussion a broken clavicle, and also um, recovering from blunt trauma to my left eye. So that's me. Mum happily took that photo whilst I was unconscious. Um, so this was also the effects of the trauma to my left eye. So I had to take eye drops three times a day. No, not three times a day. Three hours, every three hours, three different eye drops. Um, so nonetheless, my studies did suffer a fair bit and I was out for about maybe five weeks from what I remember anyway. And I was pretty devastated to return with just having one arm in a sling because it's pretty hard to do things with only one arm. Um, so, but I am pretty stubborn. I didn't want to defer, so I decided to push through and complete the semester um, and I did struggle physically and mentally but glass was pretty perfect for curbing my thoughts and keeping on track so this is me celebrating in a sling yay <laughs> so um, and I was really gifted in the fact I had a lot of support from my peers and as you see I have someone turning the pole for me whilst I blow because I had one arm. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I also ended up having some friends install studio installations for me because I was unable to climb ladders and do things. Um, so I do create interventions blocking off doorways with plastic sheets and cling wrap to make people question their habits and trajectory within a familiar environment. And I like to see how they would reconfigure their usual route to get to their destination because that's exactly what I had to do after my accident. I couldn't go the usual way home in the car because I just felt completely uncomfortable. So um, I wanted this frustration of my limitations, I wanted those around me to experience them not only physically but mentally. Um, so that's an installation I have. Um, and so because I had one arm to finish my studies with, 
The easiest way to finish the unit would be with the technique of slumping glass because there was no way I could make casts and anything overwhelmingly technical. And this I carried into my second half of this year. So when I had two arms, that was fantastic. Um, so my process with glass is pretty playful and sometimes thought through, sometimes not so much. Um, and it's really time consuming, but it's amazing. And I just love to see kind of how it turns out and just work from what I go with if it doesn't go exactly to plan. Um, so yeah, really time consuming. Um, and yeah, a lot of trial and error. So these three slumped glass panels I have installed is titled, Is It Clear Yet? And are the second part to an adjoining sound projection, text and plastic installation, which you can kind of see, called Now Contemplate What You Don't Remember. The panels have been slumped over an imagined clay landscape in reference to an earlier landscape I made in 2013. And it basically alludes to a foreign body that can manipulate another, ultimately traumatising the other until the extent that it gives way. However, it can also be seen as its literal and humorous, humorous juxtaposition as the glass panel up the top is transparent and slowly gets the motion of the landscape and then it becomes abstracted and but slowly in different trials it did end up becoming the shape of the original form however it was completely frosted and blurred so um that's the photo of my first panel i did over the original landscape and um, although I respond to the effects of personal traumatic experience, I enjoy ambiguity, obscurity and abstraction and I enjoy making people think and not defining what they should think. Frankly, I'm not one to create overly figurative pieces for that reason. Um, yeah, I just love the fact that glass is so relatable to the body and the fact it is fragile, it is strong, but really quite easily manipulated. So, um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, our next student, and people here will know, but I'm not sure, I think it's the first time we've had a student from Tasmania speak at the conference. So, uh, Pamela Skrulis. Pamela uh, actually is the recipient of the Emerging Artist uh, Scholarship for the Tasmanian Art Fair for next year. Uh, and she has a diploma from the Northwest TAFE in Tasmania. It's in Devonport. So, here's an Ausglass first. Hello, everyone. I'm just okay. Um, as Anna just mentioned, my name is Pam Skaroulis, and I am here from Latrobe in Tasmania. However, I am originally from the Pilbara and spent 30 years of my life in the Pilbara region of Western Australia. I spent a large amount of time in the outback as a child, and love learning about plants, rocks, and animals. I have a science-based degree that I have from Curtin University, which led me to a career in environmental work. Glass gives me a way to show the beauty of the environment and an insight for others into some of the remote places I have seen. The environments I have been subjected to are extremely colourful and vibrant, and this is reflected in my work. I grew up in a very artistic family, and my mother taught me how to paint from an early age. When I discovered glass, my first reaction was to paint on it, and this is one of my first plates made out of window glass. I also started making dichroic jewellery. All of my pieces have individual names after places, plants or rocks. To improve my skills, I started Taz TAFE in 2012 by enrolling in a Cert for in Visual Arts, which eventually led to a diploma that I completed last year. Studying definitely gave me more direction with my work and my skills moved up another level. Due to my environmental background, I chose a botanical theme to start with and began with trees. This is the first tree template that I drew at TAFE. 
From this image, we made sandblasted, painted, and glass piece versions. Unfortunately, I didn't realize the importance of taking images at the time and cannot show you photos of these. We also followed this through and made a cast tree. I also made trees with a wooden base. This piece is made with hewn pine. I then progressed to trees with a ceramic base and have now developed these into a product line. I also make large wall panels with trees. After learning different techniques, I started to expand my theme to include leaves. Here is one of my first leaf plates. Using the lost wax casting technique, I made this lovely gum leaf. I made many gum leaves. I made three different versions of this leaf alone following the seasons. And to be honest, I was nearly all gum leafed out, so I started to introduce other plants. Here is a maple leaf panel being made using fruit. This image is of an understory fern common in Tasmanian eucalypt forests. It only seemed natural to then develop my theme to include flowers. I have found developing flowers lots of fun as you can introduce lots of colour, and as you can tell, I do like colour. This image is of a Tasmanian, Tasmanian waratah blossoms. In Tasmania, the garden flowers are also stunning, so I've made a few pieces showing the bright colours. Rivers are also an important part of any ecosystem, and my images of rivers come from a high perspective. I remember flying home from boarding school and just being in awe looking at the river systems from above. I have always liked this design and have followed it through with this piece, but have also added other elements. This pair shows the river systems within the Tarkine Nature Reserve in Tasmania. Here you can see the other elements I have added to give it more detail. I haven't done as many pieces in regards to rivers as I would like, and it's one area that I wish to expand. When I think of rivers, I also think of river, river rocks or rocks in general. I spent many hours walking riverbeds for rocks, and this leads into my next section. Here is a forest floor plate that I made in 2012. However, I haven't really played around much with rocks as a subject until recently, where I developed my rocky cape stands. This is an area that I also wish to expand. You can't have a complete environment without including animals, and I live in the platypus capital of Tasmania, so I've gravitated towards a playful platypus. This piece here shows the shattered existence of the thylacine, otherwise known as the Tasmanian tiger. I have a passion for glass and the environment, and it is the ultimate for me that I can include both together. I can't wait to get home and try all the techniques that I've learned since I've been here. Um, thank you very much for listening to me today. And we now have uh, Hannah Gayson from um, the Australian National University School of Art. Here you are. Yay. So, you know, Hannah has um, just had a residency at Bullseye and she will be going to Pilchuck next year, which is very exciting. Oh, you've been. You've been. No wonder. <laughs> We had so many troubles emailing each other and she was always somewhere else. Now I know you were more places than I could possibly dream of. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Anna. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yes, as Anna said, my name is Hannah Gayson. I'm a student at the Glass Workshop. Um, I'm just going to start and say thank you to Kirsty Ray because... Her encouragement really gave me the, um, the confidence to pursue glass, and it's been such a rewarding experience for me. So my work is an expression of the feelings I have experienced being in the Australian landscape. I admire the patterns and colours and their vibrancy from the intense light in Australia. I'm drawn to the way the patterns and natural forming marks hold an energy, yet are contained and controlled within their environment. To me, they appear to have a sense of order, and it's this order, as well as the openness of being outside, that provide the feelings of clarity that inform my work. For me, the act of making is a way of mapping. I arrange multiple elements into a visual representation that I impose my own order to. 
The repetitive act of sorting and arranging helps me achieve the feelings of clarity that I associate with being in the landscape. By mixing glass powders, I am able to maintain control of the colour and density of the fused glass. I like the process of drawing and shaping the powder to create abstract marks and patterns. I enjoy how shadows highlight the repeating forms and create a vibrating effect. I feel that this generates a feeling of energy that is contained within the structure of the work. The open spaces surrounding each of the pieces represent the openness I feel in the landscape. I like the way the light plays with the colour, density and textured surface. Earlier I was exploring other materials, such as pins and thread, to assemble my work. I have recently incorporated steel for additional structure. It allows me to build a basic framework to contain and control the energy of the glass components. The metal framework ground the glass components as they appear to float, light and open. I used a basic grid form for the frame to support the glass but not visually dominate. Uh, during my study, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to go to Pilchuck Glass School for a course with Anjali Srinivasan and Amy Soans. And this course encouraged experimentation with a focus on process, gesture and technique. This course provided me with a wider appreciation for processes that are possible and I'm now incorporating them into my practice. I particularly enjoyed using the kilns for hot sculpting. Another significant opportunity that I'm grateful for is the amazing five weeks I've spent at the Bullseye Glass Factory, along with other ANU graduates, Lee Douglas, Marina Hanser, and Ruth Oliphant. I can't thank Lani and Dan enough for the generosity and kindness they showed us, and for letting us give Sam our glass wish lists as well. And as I've said, color is a key feature to my work. So during the residency, I made many samples of mixing colours for future reference. I wanted to make the most of having the full range of bullseye products available by experimenting as much as possible. I used stringers and rods, confetti, powders, fritz, the sheets, whatever I could find. I had a great time. Um, and one technique I tried was to flatten the glass while fusing. I'm really happy with these results of the thinner sheets of fused glass as I feel that they include the qualities that are important to me, such as varying colours and densities, abstracted patterns, and graphic marks, while still having a lightness of form. With a focus on this technique, I looked at ways of applying texture, ways of arranging, assembling, and fusing the glass back together, and some more hot sculpting. And I'm really looking forward to developing these ideas and techniques um, as I start my honours year, on, yeah, on Monday, actually, so. Uh, <laughs> so finally, just the biggest thank you to the ANU staff, all incredible artists them themselves, Richard, Nadej, Phil and Mel, for the endless support and encouragement they provide all of us lucky students. Thank you. Our last student is Sarah Humphrey. Sarah Humphrey is from the Sydney College of Art at the University of Sydney. Sarah's work is, I'm a caster, so of course it's a bit of casting in there that I adore. Um, we had a very funny conversation where she just told me something that she'd just done by the seat of her pants and put back together in the kiln and worked without checking whether it had any stress in it. And she looked at me blankly and said, what are you talking about? And I went, I need some of that. Um, she won, uh, uh, well, her work uh, was uh, the winner in the uh, National Art Prize for Students in 2014. Thank you. 
Um, hi, yes, I'm Sarah Humphrey from um, Sydney College of the Arts. Um, I'm just going to talk about one project today. This is my most recent large-scale project, a Geocerulari. So it's a performance work on electric glass, violin, and cello. Um, so these are the instruments there. Uh, the first iteration of this work was uh, just a single, more traditional um, violin that I performed on myself. Um, so this um, project was done in my second year. Um, it tried to engage in two crafts that I have a history in, so classical music and glass art. Um, Geoterolare means to fiddle or to play in Italian, which is the um, sort of universal classical music language. Um, and the, the whole performance was intended to be characterized by playfulness. I was trying to take the mickey out of the, the pomp and hauteur of uh, classical performance. Um, to my disappointment, no one really took it with mirth. Um, everyone was sort of a little bit more solemn, but that's, that's okay, I think. <laughs> so yeah, this work um, fed off the first iteration, but it became more about um, facilitating an experience in which both classical music and glass art spheres can be um, experienced by a broader audience. Um, classical music, as far as I can see, has such a rich history and culture, but it's also developed really rigid um, rules of engagement that make it harder for un uninitiated audiences, and particularly younger audiences, to um, access. Um, interesting things happen when traditional classical performances are taken into the art space because a lot of those rules are lifted. Uh, similarly, interesting things happen when glass, which is traditionally exhibited in galleries on plinths and cabinets and whatnot, um, is taken into the performance space. Um, um, yeah, a lot of my work has kinetic elements and I really get off on the sort of tension when you see glass, which is so precious and so fragile, um, used and played with. Um, I'm just going to show you a snippet of the performance so you can hear them. So. Mm. Um, yeah, that video is, it, so the performance is about 10 minutes long. It's um, up on Vimeo if you want to have a look at it. So that's the link there. Um, the, oh, um, as someone who usually um, prefers to do everything myself, it was really formative to work with um, Emma and Felix, the musicians. Um, so they compose their own music and also do a lot of arranging. So um, I gave them quite a bit of freedom over the, the repertoire and the arrangements. So it was sort of headed towards a collaborative process than, than an outsourcing one. Um, and that was yeah, a really great experience. Um, it was really satisfying seeing the project get pushed further by the combination of skills um, than I could have ever taken it on my own. Um, and aside from their musical skill, they just have a really um, scrumptious performance dynamic when they play together. They don't count in the, a lot of the, the pieces that um, they've written. Um, they improvise sections and they just like communicate by looking at each other. It's really, really lovely to watch. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about the production of the instruments. Um, you're probably all familiar with the processes, but anyway. Um, so the violin was cast, oh, it's lost wax casting. The violin was cast fully in wax and carved and um, the cello I carved partly out of foam. Um, the fingerboard, strings, bows, tin rest, bridges, tail pieces, everything else was um, salvaged from old instruments or bought. I got quite a bit of support from Marcus Dillon, who is our um, studio technician at Sydney. Um, we did lots of troubleshooting together and um, yeah, he helped me work through a lot of the challenges. So um, the things we were dealing with were uh, how to ask glass to hold quite a bit of string tension. So um, in the violin, we ended up reinforcing the uh, neck with steel bars. Um, and things like the, the pegs, which on a traditional instrument are little sort of wedge shapes that get jammed in. Um, 
obviously you can't do that with glass because it'll stress and crack. So I sourced mechanical pegs, which are more similar to guitar pegs from the States, and they glue in. Um, it's been really exciting and overwhelming just how many people have been willing to get behind this project and support it. Um, early on I had meetings with musicians to discuss design and ergonomics. Um, so some of the things that I, I got out of that were, um, for instance, the, the wing at the knee there and the arm that rests on the chest of a cello are the only two parts of a real cello that need to rest on your body for it to be secure. Um, also, the, um, the wing and the arm, they um, sort of pair back a little bit to simulate the depth of a real cello. Um, both the instruments play differently to wooden ones, but the aim and design was to minimize the differences or, or just to work out which ones we could get away with so that they're still playable and comfortable. Um, during production, I consulted a lot also with Sydney String Center, which is near my home. Um, they were really, really helpful, which is um, surprising because usually string makers have a reputation for um, being a bit protective of their knowledge. They, they function a lot like guilds. Um, but yeah, they were, they were really helpful. They provided me with some um, damaged instruments to cast and to um, get patterns from and help me with forming bridges and that sort of thing. So yeah, the support's just been really exciting. It's um, been overwhelming. Um, moving forward, I'd really like to build on this project. Um, I've really loved collaborating with musicians especially, and I've loved the challenge of um, troubleshooting and working out each instrument, um, which, yeah, each come up with their own problems. Um, so yeah, I'd like to push those a little further. I'm keen to, yeah, keen to take a slightly different direction, um, either with the, the music or the instruments that I make, but um, yeah, we'll see, watch this space. Thank you. Thank you, students, that was fabulous. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, that question was just about the um, form of the instrument, so they're quite skeletal at the moment, and would I consider um, exploring the acoustic qualities? Um, prob probably not. Um, the, the sound quality of the instruments has never been the main focus. Um, it's always been really important to me that they do play. When I was making the first one, my lecturer told me that it wasn't going to work, but I should give it a go anyway. Um, and I said, okay, then I will. <laughs> um, but yeah, that one, um, a lot of people were saying, I'll just, it, it can be a sculpture, it can be a sculpture, but that doesn't interest me at all. So they do need to play. Um, the sound quality itself isn't, isn't my main concern. Um, there's one other set of glass working string instruments that I know of, and they were produced by um, a glass company in Japan and they're acoustic, and they don't really sound very nice. Um, when you start making string instruments in other materials, it can like sort of mute the sound quite a bit, whereas if you rely on the electric um, sound systems, then it, um, you can sort of manipulate those a bit to get the sound that you want, and I'd rather just do that and explore other things. Does anyone else have a question? First of all, I also want to say that was <laughs> Does anyone want to take that? <laughs> Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Interesting question. Um, and interesting as well. So I'll talk about it from my perspective in... Um, being a glass assistant initially and then starting the contemporary art degree, I was talking to Naomi early, who was studying at ECU when I started my first year of the, my degree. And I'd been art stalking her for a long, long time during that time. Um, and we've got Denise as well, who's an artist and a 
technician at the uni, so following people like that to see where they're going, what they're doing. Um, really interesting, think, thinking there's lots of possibilities. Going into the um, university then, and there's always a question about, are we going to stay open this year? Are we not? I know we've been talking um, with Darcy as well about the on-off uh, situation at Monash. So it's always a question mark. Um, but I think as long as we can try and incorporate glass into our artworks and promote it as much as possible as well. I think artists don't promote themselves as well as they could sometimes as well. That's another big factor. That's one point. Um, interesting, I, I can't answer the uh, question about where it's going in the future. I think there is hope, but I think it's always a question in um, institutions, unfortunately, as to whether it's cost efficient, return on investment, all of that kind of stuff. Especially in current times where budgets and everything are such a big issue for universities or everywhere. Um, so, I think it's a case of watch this space. Yeah, well, I mean, we've been um, discussing amongst each other quite a bit about what's going on at our institutions, and there's been a few changes. I mean, Monash has just brought in classes, but a few of us were talking about how um, the studios are um, seem to be shutting off areas and becoming a little bit less accessible. Um, I. I yeah, don't know specifically what's happening at each one, but SCA has just had a change where we've um, merged the glass studio with the sculpture studio. So um, it's a good thing for the uni, but not so good for the glass community itself, um, which has sort of been dispersed a little bit. Um, but I think that I, I don't suspect that any of the studios will shut down. And even in the studios that are running quite successfully, um, within a cohort of, of students, studying glass, there's always at the end of the degree a bunch of people that run off and do other things and a, and a bunch of people that will continue it on. And I, th I think it's the same with anybody's art career. Um, it is what you make of it and the degree is what you make of it and you could be handed the best, most supportive degree and not really make much of it. So I, I, I'm not worried because I think that the people um, that fall in love with glass as everyone here has um, really takes every opportunity that they can get and will seek out the opportunities that there are. Um, so I, I think that it's good. I think the future is good. Are you asking us to answer that right now? <laughs> Just asking if you want us to answer that right now, whether we'll be on the board. <laughs> yes, we have.
Are there any other questions? <laughs> is this on? Yeah. Hmm. My projects always vary. So um, I really link in sociology, sociology, so my background of sociology with my art. And um, I choose the material depending on the project. Um, so at the moment I'm working on a socially engaged art project, which is getting quite huge where I'm involving people to be a part of the artwork talk to you afterwards about it in more detail, but that's really interesting. And that's, um, it's starting to kick off in Perth, but it's keeping at it and getting it known, you know, getting it out there. Um, I, now, I have now finished my degree, um, so that's going to be interesting as well, um, not having the structured institutional environment to work in, you know. Um, so to build it into my life now with whatever's happening post-degree. Um, Socially engaged art is the way I'm going at the moment. Yeah, and, and the work I did in relation to that project, the materials I used were print, um, huge installation work as well as projections and music. So my materials always vary. But I always come back to glass somehow or the other. Last year I had to have shoulder surgery, so couldn't do too much work. Uh, one of the projects I worked on um, where Denise was supervising uh, was a design unit. Um, and I really wanted to work on glass, you know, having a thirst for it like everyone else here does. Um, I, I tweaked my way around it and I couldn't use glass because of my dodgy arm. So I ended up using sugar as a material instead, which has the same quality and then doing research molecular structure as glass. Um, so I tend to come back to glass some way or the other, but let the work decide. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Sure. <laughs> and um, stand on our own two feet. I think it's a really exciting time as well. And everyone who's come before me, you've done a fantastic job in opening this up for us and in supporting us. And I want to say a massive thank you to all of you. <laughs> right. Um, well, thank you. Um, on behalf of everybody here, um, I'd like to actually thank our students 
I'd like to thank their institutions for sending them to us and supporting them to get here. Um, so thanks. Yeah. We have uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Well, not housekeeping, I suppose it's housekeeping. Okay, so if you have pre-ordered a T-shirt, um, they have arrived. So you can pick your T-shirts up at the registration desk. And more importantly, or maybe not for all of us, if you wanted a T-shirt, but for the rest of us, um, there are drinks in the foyer after this. And the wine has been very lovely donated to us um, by Sip Wines and uh, Dave Garter. Thank you. <laughs>